Welcome. Welcome to week three of MPAI 600 here at Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies. Uh, the only announcement I have is your paper one, your collection strategy, is due uh, right now, tonight, yesterday, depending on when you're watching this. But uh, I got no requests for an extension, uh, so none will be given. And uh, I will have those back to you. I want to have them back to you in a week uh, by, by the next Sunday by the time I tape this again. Uh, so, again, have those into me uh, yesterday, tonight, whenever you're watching this. Okay, so uh, review of last week. Um, we went over requirements and obviously integrating them into the collection plan, and, and we, we covered that in the, the lecture, and you hopefully integrated that into your, into your collection plan. So intelligence traps, that was the other part. So key issues. Again, some of the key ones brought up confirmation bias. Uh, mirror imaging, and you saw examples of uh, we saw examples of confirmation bias in the in the confessions. We talked about it in the Iraq WMD in the in the tradecraft primer, and we'll go in more detail. Uh, mirror imaging, when you see yourself or you see an adversary, and you assume that they they have the same values, the same uh, conditions that you do, and then obviously the confessions. I think displayed this all, and that's why I wanted you to apply, and, and most of you did that, I hope the rest of you did that in your discussion sections, but I wanted you to apply the confessions, uh, or what you saw in the Tradecraft Primer to the confessions documentary, and there was there was plenty of material there, just a, a couple of things uh, going forward. Um, so again, classic confirmation bias. Uh, they settled on one person, and then they contorted their theory to, to settle that it was actually Navy personnel involved in the rape and murder. Um, and they went through serious mental contortions, particularly after the DNA evidence came in, to, to prove that, that confirmation bias. So that was, um, th this was classic, to, to a, a ludicrous extent, uh, confirmation bias. A vividness bias. Um, when you saw the juries or the confessions being played in front of the juries, that mattered a, a hell of a lot more than evidence of DNA and, and scientific evidence. Um, just the way that was talked, the way that the, the confessions had an impact on the jury were, were examples of vividness bias. Detective Ford, when he was interrogating, um, he knew that. He knew that a confession would play in front of a jury and get a conviction far more than alibi evidence, motive evidence, uh, DNA evidence, um, and the, and he played to that aspect to get the confessions. Negative evidence. No one asked. Not the juries. Not the judges. Not the appellate judges. Not the prosecutors. You know they were looking. They were fixating on trying to get uh, these these kids. At the time, they were kids. Um, get them convicted. So they were looking for evidence, any evidence that they were involved. What they didn't do is they didn't flip the question on its head and ask, if these kids committed the crime, this murder and gang rape, what else should we be seeing? And we would be seeing uh, you know, DNA evidence. You would see these kids would have hair and fiber all over themselves. They would have left hair and fiber and other trace evidence uh, to them. No one asked that question and flipped the, 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 the evidence on its head. Um, we're going to talk about that in depth when we talk about Iraq WMD and not some of the other case studies we have in this in this course. But that was, that's a, a particular gap that, again, everyone suffered from. Clientelism. Detective Ford wanted to get a conviction. The prosecutors wanted to get a conviction. They would do anything to get the, in, in, the conviction. Um, instead of looking for the greater good or trying to find their truth, they were trying to please their clients. You know, the detective was trying to plead the prosecutors. Prosecutors were trying to plead the, uh, were, were, saw the public as their clients, and they wanted to arrest these people or give the perception that they were doing something to solve this, this heinous murder. Uh, and that had pressures all along the line that led to, again, the false conviction of, of the Norfolk form. And then finally, I just want to leave you with some Georgetown, uh, the Georgetown values here. And I don't know if anyone in this class is Catholic or Jesuit or anyone cares, or anyone's religious, or, or use religion as a guiding principle. Um, but Georgetown does try and espouse a certain level of value 
in you. And in this case, again, it's, it's a value that you guys are going to be leaders uh, eventually in, you know, in law enforcement or, or whatever um, position you want to you espouse to. And you will have power over these people. The, the prosecutors, the, the detectives, they all had immense power to put these people in jail for a long period of time. And this problem, you know, the documentary ended in 2009. Um, these guys were not fully compensated. Yeah, you know, this didn't end till 2019, till last year, um, where they got final restitution from the, Nor- the, the city of Norfolk for this. So it took 20 years to get these, and in 20 years these guys were, you know, essentially robbed of their life. And, again, this is a basic value of, or... Uh, a, no one saw the, the human value. No one saw the social justice value um, in, in these wrongful convictions. So that's hopefully you, you take that take that away going forward. And then the last thing I want to leave you with, and I had a student bring this up a few classes ago, and it's, it's an interesting point. Um, you know, we talk about analytical bias in this course, and you know his his comment, which resonated with me, is good people suffer from biases, from analytical biases. Um, Good people have confirmation bias. Good people have negative evidence, um, into, whether they're intel analysts, law enforcement. This was not a case of that. This was a case of an evil person committing evil acts. And that was Detective Ford railroading these, these, these young men. Um, and they, they, he didn't suffer from bias. He suffered from evil. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think that's an interesting point. Uh, I disagree with it for several reasons. Uh, first, it wasn't just Detective Ford. It was an entire system from Detective Ford to the prosecutors, the judges, the appellate judges, the juries, the governor. All of them played a factor in this. So it wasn't just one bad apple. Um, it was an entire system behind it. Um, so that, that's the one thing. And then the second thing, um, I, I have a pretty craven view on human nature. And I, I think all of us in the right circumstance can be all be Detective Fords. Um, we, we look back, you know, and I'm sure most of you had a, a visceral reaction to his behavior and, and to what happened here. But I think in the moment, at certain times, pardon me, we could be under certain pressures, uh, given certain ex- life experiences, we could be detective forts. We could do awful things to people. Uh, we could lose our humanity. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's my spin on it. I'll, I'll let you decide. Uh, which way you fall on. So week three preview, uh, two case studies, strategic surprise. Uh, these are uh, critical intelligence historical events. Uh, so the first is Pearl Harbor, um, and the second is the Yom Kippur War in Israel. Again, both surprises to uh, their respective intelligence communities. And the question I want you to think about when you start going through the readings and start going through the lecture where were the failures? And I'll give you options, but I want you to decide. Where do you think the primary failure was? Was it in collection? Was it in analysis? Was it on the, the interface between intelligence community and the military leadership? Were pol- policymakers failing to act? You know, they had all the information, they had all the correct intelligence, but they just didn't put in mitigation circumstances. Or were there underlying circumstances, just bad circumstances that happened? So the readings documentary, the Dahl Intelligence Surprise Attack. Um, I'm actually going to s- take this one out. Um, I'm going to substitute it. So go ahead, read the Dahl and the Pearl Harbor lectures, and then come back to the Yom Kippur War. I'll, I'll have the substitute in uh, by Monday uh, for that. So don't read the Avi Shalim. You're, you're going to get the uh, Rydell, Bruce Rydell's article from the Brookings Institute on the Yom Kippur War. And then the Al Jazeera, The Crossing. It's, it's actually a three-part documentary. Just watch the first part. Uh, and follow the intelligence failures regarding uh, the the Yom Kippur War. So, if there's is- questions or issues, let me know, and I look forward to to your discussion.